Morning everybody, it's Ali Board here. Welcome to Technique Tuesday. Once again, broadcasting live from my studio down on the south coast of the UK here in Dorset, bringing you a slightly revised Technique Tuesday. We've been doing it for a couple of weeks now where I share with you the projects that I am working on. I try to let you have a little bit of an insight into my thought processes, how I tackle a project, the route that I go in, all those kind of things. Now, if you uh, haven't seen the previous bits, they're all archived either on my Facebook page, because you might not be watching this live on Facebook, you might be watching it on Catch Up uh, via YouTube or another platform, or you can pop over to my blog. Now, all of that information is in the live broadcast. I will repeat that information on the YouTube channel, but it's also worth keeping in mind that some of you out there might have heard my very big news at the weekend, which is that on the 29th of August, the 29th of this month, I will be launching a brand spanking new website. That's the big news I've been alluding to all this time. And it's going to be www.learningtopaint.co.uk. And that is where you're going to find everything to do with my tuition from now on. So you might be wanting to sign up for class, you might be wanting uh, a few free resources in terms of uh, recommendations for materials, you might want to be finding Technique Tuesday in the archive on the blog, it's all going to be there. Now obviously for the next few weeks, whilst I will still be bringing you Technique Tuesday, I'm going to be a little bit busy with that. So I hope that you can bear with me while I get all of those things in place because I am so excited about that going live. It's something that I've wanted to do for a long, long time now and now is the time to do it. Now if you are watching via the Facebook page this morning. It would be lovely if you could uh, pop up, give us a wave and uh, say hello. I'm going to have a quick look at the comments to give some of you a bit of a shout out. Comments coming in thick and fast this morning. Who gets first comment of the day award? Uh, that goes to Martina this morning. Good morning, Martina. Who else have we got? We've got Lynn in the room saying good morning, my lovely cheeky Brit. I can't imagine what she's alluding to. Uh, who else we got? Uh, Maureen, Kathy, Joe, another Joe, two Joes in a row. Uh, Lynn, Trisha, good morning, lovely. Jane, Anita, good morning, lovely. <clears throat> uh, Val, uh, how, who else we got? Oh, Mum is saying uh, that is Liz for those of you <laughs> who are playing catch up. Uh, I'm on the move. I hope she means going somewhere nice in a car and not uh, permanently, otherwise there's news for me, I didn't know this. Uh, Joy Rabina uh, in lovely Wales. Uh, Janet, oh thank you, Janet is saying she likes my top. Yes, I sort of, it kind of reflects my work, I think that's why I was drawn to it. Uh, who else have we got? Lots of people, Rosie, good morning, saying exciting news about the website. Pam, good morning. Uh, da, 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 da. Who else we got? Jan, uh, Trudy. Um, oh, uh, Liz uh, is saying, my mum is saying she had a sneaky peek at the website. She did. I was sharing with her all the things that I've done recently. I know you can go over to that site. You can go to www.learningtopaint.co.uk, but you can't see anything at the moment because it's hidden behind a password. And I know some of you have said, ooh, I've tried all sorts of passwords, you sneaky lot, but you won't know it, I promise. It's not elbow related, animal related or any of those sorts of things, so stop trying. <laughs> Uh, Kareen, Margaret, uh, Linda P, uh, Anne, Jean. Uh, Jean is saying, for once I was ready. Hello to mum too. And the beautiful Rose is in the room as well. Good morning, lovely Rose. Long time no see. Really lovely to have you here. Thank you very much. So what are we doing today? Today, we are on part four of my B project. So that is a project, it's kind of turning into an illustration project as opposed to a fine art project. We'll talk more about that as we uh, go on today. I have shared with you how I've put that drawing together. And uh, today is going to be the day where we talk about the materials. I'm going to describe to you my choices. We're going to do a bit of an experiment today. And what I'm trying to do is hopefully help you when you get to this point in a project, 
It doesn't always happen at this moment in the sort of timeline of a project. It might happen right at the start, might happen a bit closer to the end, but I am definitely at the point now where I've kind of drawn it all out. I know what it is that I want to put together in my composition, and now it's down to a choice of materials. So we need to do some experimenting. Now, before I do uh, all of that, I'm just gonna see who else has popped up in the room. Lots of people saying that it's not fair that my mum has seen the new website and no one else has. My mum was probably being very smug about that. Um, uh, Fran is saying she's on annual leave from work, watching while doing a bit of sewing. Ooh, multitasking, very impressive. Uh, Mary, good morning. Um, Ali D is having <laughs> issues with her tech. Uh, Viv, good morning. Um, what's Viv saying? Catching up as Tuesday um, has been minding granddaughter day, but they are away this week. So much to catch up with. Yes, got lots to catch up with, Viv. Um, lots of people saying good morning to each other as well, which is really, really awesome. I'm glad you're all here. So should we go to the uh, overhead camera and you can see what it is that we're going to be talking about today and the kind of thing that has got us this far. So here is my final line drawing. This is what we've worked our way towards and I, you know me, you know how organised I like to be. I've actually put all of my reference material here in this folder so that if uh, it comes to pass that I need to change anything or if this uh, project um, is going to be useful for something else in the future, I know that all of my reference is here. I can find it really easily. I can refer back to it, all of those kind of things. All the bits and pieces of evidence that got me to this point. Now, we've got a few photos in here. They might uh, become useful later on for various parts. Uh, most of the photographs I got from Pixabay, a couple of them are my own photographs, but uh, most I got from the website Pixabay, which is a royalty-free website. It means that you can use uh, other people's photographs without fear of reproduction, copyright, or otherwise. That's upside down, isn't it? Ivy growing upwards. Mm. Um, we've got that columbine and then right at the end I've kind of got this is where we got to last week let's put it the right way up Ali so that the people at home can see um, this is where we were talking about the um, addition of this honeycomb pattern in the background and I was sharing with you uh, using a stencil to be able to do that so that is the actual drawing that we had last week. Um, what I'm going to do as well in just a second, if I can get the technology to work, here is that time lapse video that I shared with you last week about how I got to that point in the B. You can watch this back over on the blog post if you want to be able to see it so that you can see me working through the project, doing my research, making those little tweaks. Um, of things you can of course uh, pause it when you watch it back on the website so if there's a particular bit that you want to see it is individual shots and they're all linked together so yes it does go by super fast but you can watch it as many times as you like and there you go you can see me uh, doing that last little bit of inking in getting it sorted getting those kind of various elements that I was struggling with last week all of that kind of stuff so I'll let that there. Yeah, look at me typing away like a speed demon. <laughs> so uh, that is how we got to this point in the proceedings. That's how we got to this. Now, what I've done is that I've taken some copies of this as well. These last two entries in this folder are no different. What I've done is taken some copies so that I can use one of them today where I have got uh, some colour things to discuss. I've also got um, a piece of watercolour paper as well. Now, you're all going to be asking me what surface I'm going to paint this on. I'm pretty sure, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that I am going to be doing the final piece on Saunders Waterford. This is Saunders Waterford watercolour paper. So this is uh, 200 pound, 425 gram. That's the, the same two things. 
Uh, it is a not surface, N-O-T, and that means that it's not hot pressed, which is the smooth one, and it's not rough, which is the very textured one. The hot pressed surface, I personally have um, kind of a few issues with trying to get it the, the watercolour to move on it. So I prefer the not surface, but I am a sort of slightly concerned that um, when I go to paint on this, there might be a little bit too much texture for um, the kind of illustrate, illustrative feel of my bee. But I haven't particularly made that decision yet. The reason that I have a piece of Saunders Waterford here today is so that I'm testing the products that I think I'm gonna use out on a surface similar to my final surface. There is a lot of discussion to be had about this in terms of, morning Nula, um, in terms of, well, why don't you just practice your materials on a cheap piece of paper? And then you're sort of um, not wasting a piece of good quality watercolor paper. And there's two schools of thought on that, aren't there? That of course, if you practice your color um, mixes or your materials on something cheap, yes, of course, you're not going to be um, spending a lot of money in doing that. But are they going to react the same on a practice piece of paper as they are on the final piece of paper that you're going to use? Now, I've got a fresh piece here because for the purposes of recording it's nice for you to be able to see that I've got a kind of nice clean clear bit of watercolour paper but there's nothing to say of course that if you've done a particular painting project and it hasn't kind of worked you flip it over and you use the back of it. The one good thing about Saunders Waterford of course is that you can use both sides of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape that down. Now just in case you're wondering what that uh, fancy bit of mesh stuff is underneath on my drawing board all it is is a piece of non-slip mesh it's a sort of I don't know how to describe it really it's a sort of like a silicon thing but what it does look if I put my piece of paper on here it just goes south all the time and I have my drawing board at a slight angle which you can't necessarily appreciate in the camera but I have it up at a slight angle so that my head doesn't get in shot or I try not to get my head in shot now what this means is that I can put my uh, drawing onto there and it's not slipping but I do want to tape my piece of watercolour paper down because I might need to lift it up put it back down again all of those kind of things and there you go look back to slippiness again so I've taped that down just hinged it at the top I'm not hinging it to stick it down or to stop it moving or any of those kind of things I'm literally hinging it down so that I've got opportunities to lift that up use the underside do all sorts of things with it so don't read too much into that at all what I might also do is pop a little bit of masking tape on my B line drawing so that if I need to introduce this for any reason, then uh, it's not going to fall down the page. Now, there's some questions coming in. Sandra, good morning. Lynn is saying, I often wonder if I need to paint on a clean sheet as if I am lucky enough to sell the piece, I feel like the back should be clean. Is that right? Oh, that's really interesting, Lynn. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's me being terribly, terribly flippant. Um, I don't necessarily uh, paint on the back of a clean piece um, just because, you know, if you open the back of a painting up, it's quite nice to see other things going on. I've bought many a painting from other artists where there are things uh, on the back and it's quite kind of insightful. I've seen paintings that I've purchased with artists annotation on the back or colour testing. Now as an artist myself I find that very interesting. It's obviously entirely up to you. Joy is saying will you stretch the paper when you go for the final take? No Joy I won't. I'm not a particular paper stretcher person. Um, lots of reasons for that. With um, Saunders Waterford I tend to find that I don't need to stretch it particularly. I tend to find that if I don't stretch it then I can access the back of it to be able to dry it. Saunders Waterford stands up to uh, quite a lot of abuse when you paint it and it isn't going to buckle and also the real reason if it's just you and me in the room joy that i um don't stretch my paper is usually because i haven't prepared enough and i can't be bothered 
Is that shocking? Possibly, but uh, that's one of the reasons I use Saunders Waterford. Uh, the lovely Andrew is in the room. Good morning, Andrew. <laughs> and Janet is in the room too. Good morning to all of you. So let's bring line drawing back in and we can make a start discussing the materials that we might want to use. Now, if you're paying attention, taking notes or whatever, I think it's really important for me to say that it does, there is no right and wrong with this, okay? There's no kind of, oh, well, you have to use this selection of materials because if you don't use this selection of materials, your project is not going to work. That is not true. That is categorically not true because if it was true, then all artists would use all the same materials for all their projects. And we really don't. This is when you get to the point where you're thinking, well, how am I going to fill this in? How am I going to paint this? How am I going to interpret this? It is down to personal preference, isn't it? Good morning, Thea. Good morning, Anne. Um, those materials that you choose are an extension of your hand, an extension of your creativity. They are materials that you might think suit the subject matter. They are materials particular to you as an artist. They are materials that you particularly think are going to fit this uh, way of interpreting this subject matter. So choose things that you are comfortable with or choose things that you might want to experiment with. Choose things that you've got in your stash that you haven't used for a long time. But whatever you choose, no matter what it is, test it first. Don't make it so that the first time you pick up a particular product, product is when you use it directly on your painting. Because if you're not very confident with it, or you don't really know how it's going to work, you certainly don't want the first time you use it to be on a, a precious painting or project or commission or any of those kind of things. So that is exactly why I am testing it first. What I wanted to do was to bring your attention to some of the things that you might want to be thinking about. And what I'm gonna do at the same time of uh, looking at my picture. What I'm going to do actually is move this over to the right ever so slightly. I'm going to write down the things that I need to be thinking about, okay? So traditionally, watercolour works from the background to the foreground, traditionally. I'm not entirely sure that this is a traditional watercolour because let's face it, it's a bee covered in flowers. I'm not sure you'd find one of these. So that is why it's a kind of no man's land between a fine art project where you are interpreting something naturalistically or with that kind of fine art painterly way of doing something. Um, and illustration. Now, morning, Susan. Um, Ulrika, good morning. Thea, good morning. Um, now, the the sort of the, the borderline between fine art and illustration is a very very narrow one and you could argue that this is a fine art project because i'm going to be doing some of these flowers naturalistically you could argue that it's an illustration project from the fact that it is encompassed by quite a lot of linear work that it is working to quite a specific brief I'm not actually going to put uh, a flag in any of those things. I'm actually going to sort of say, morning, Teresa, that uh, I don't know whether it's a fine art project or an illustration project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the things that I know and the things that I know in terms of water soluble media particularly if you think about watercolour gouache brush and the like, is that you tend to start in the background and you work to the foreground. And that way it means that I can paint all of my background in first. I don't have to worry about disturbing anything that's going on in the front because I haven't painted it yet. So one of the considerations that I need to make is my background. So I'm gonna write background question mark on there. So I need to think about the colour, and I need to think about the material that I'm going to use, okay? And I'll answer that in a second. Then we've got the honeycomb, haven't we? We've got that interim that we talked about last week. So it's not the thing that is furthest away. Uh, good morning, Jean and Terry, lovely to have you in the room. Um, it's not this bit of it. It's the kind of the interim between the background and the bee. So we've got the honeycomb to uh, think about too. 
And again, what are we going for in terms of colour and what are we going to be using about in terms of material? And then at this point, I will always kind of think to myself, well, is there anything else that I want to put in the background? Is there another element that I potentially want to include that could maybe tie up um, the background to the foreground and vice versa? So um, I usually put that as anything else. And I'm sure the experienced painters uh, out there are thinking, well, she's probably think talking about brusho. And yes, I am. <laughs> I am talking about brusho. Am I going to use some brusho in my background? So there you go. That gets added to the list. Then obviously you've got the B. So I'm not talking about the, the flowers and all of those kind of things. We have, um, let's just put um, asterisks next to these because these are the things uh, I need to think about. Um, so then we've got our B. And again, Colour, oh no, learn to spell, Ali. Uh, we've got colour considerations, haven't we? We've got material uh, considerations as well. Now, don't forget that all of these need to tie up. These are not individual necessarily. They need to all link up in some way. So are the materials that I use in my background going to be the same as the materials that I use in my B? All of those considerations, so all of these potentially link up okay and it's quite important to think about that because you don't want to go at it with a sort of scattergun approach it's busy enough already okay good morning i'm really hoping that i pronounce your name right is it pauline um from belgium how lovely to have you here this morning and good morning and b as well um you don't want to use one set of materials for the background, a different set of materials for the honeycomb, different set of materials for anything else, different set of materials for the bee, because it is just going to look like you've kind of thrown an art store at it and you haven't really made any considerations, okay? So we've got the bee element of it. And then we've also obviously got the flower element as well. So in terms of colour, what colour palette are we going to have? and materials too and it all links up and then I'm also going to put another anything else okay now what do I mean by the last kind of anything else anything else that you think will finish it off so that probably isn't a consideration as far as colour is concerned but it's definitely a consideration as far as material is concerned now in here morning Kate um, is also things like Am I going to go back over it with a pen? Am I going to go back over it with a metallic? Do I want to put a metallic element in there too? So again, can you see all of these things need to be intertwined? All of these things need to link up. And I know that's a lot of consideration. And I know that there'll be lots of you out there going, oh, blimey, Ali, really? I've got to make all these decisions. But this is what makes you a self-sufficient painter. When you turn up to a tutorial, chances are, if it's a step-by-step -step tutorial, we've already designed, your tutor will have already designed this for you. They will have already selected the reference. They'd have created the line drawing for you. And they will have gone through this process, not necessarily as detailed as this, because a lot of it will come as kind of second nature, but they will have certainly thought to themselves, now, what is for the good of the project? You might be in that particular tutorial because you want to learn how to use one of these things, or it might be a building block of painting in terms of, well, I really don't understand color theory, so that's what I'm here for. So we will kind of instinctively go through this process for you so that when you come to the tutorial you've already had that selected for you which is great because it means you guys don't have to think about anything but it's not good in terms of being self-sufficient because you need to understand this process as long-winded as it may be so now we get to the very nitty gritty, don't we? In front of me, you can't see it at the moment, but I have all sorts of bits and pieces because I promise you, I have not made any finite decisions yet about any of these things. Now, you may think, oh yeah, Ali, of course you have. Of course you have. Of course you've, you've been through it, you've planned it all, and then you're presenting it to us. I promise you, and you know that uh, is absolutely my word, that I have not pre-planned this. Because what's the point? If you want to understand my thought process, what is the point of me 
kind of putting a finite version out there so that you don't understand <coughs> why I'm choosing the things that I am. So I haven't planned it. Now that is not good in broadcasting terms because it means that basically most of my kit is around and about my drawing board. This morning you probably can see I've got a line of watercolours here, um, I've got my brush roll here, I've got a palette just in case, I've got a bit of brush, I've got a bit of metallic, I've got some pens over here, I've got some pens down here on the floor as well, I've got a big box of gouache and I've got some other stuff going on as well. So <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, slightly hyperventilating as far as being a broadcaster is concerned because I don't know the answers to any of this stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through everything and we're going to make some decisions. Then I'm going to think about it over the weekend and then I can come back to you and you will understand why I've chosen the things that I have. So let's start with brushes. What brushes am I going to use for the project? Now, you didn't think I was going to start there, did you? What project? What brushes am I going to use from the project and why is it important? It's important because you need to apply these materials. They need to be an extension of your hand. And therefore, if they're an extension of your hand, then you need to select some brushes that are going to do that for you. Now, this is my brush roll. Um, uh, mum made this for me. Um, I think it caused her quite a lot of heartache to make. And no, she's not taking commissions, <laughs> before you ask. Um, she made it for me because, excuse me, <coughs> dear, um, when I uh, purchased my set of imitation sable brushes, I wanted to keep them long lasting as long as possible. OK, so she made this for me. Um, it's also got some of my older brushes in there, too, and some brushes that I am occasionally asked to demonstrate with. So the SAA silver brushes. There's a couple of Kalinsky sables in there. There are what else we got? Color shaper, palette knife. Um, what else have we got? Oh, all sorts of stuff going on in here. Um, so uh, this is just the kind of the main thing that I feed from. I have got a massive box in the studio of brushes that I use that I dip in and out of. But this is my main kind of tool. This is not, this is not for me to show off. This is not me being smug in look at all the brushes that I've got. Why I'm showing you this is because... Um, I've got all these brushes plus another box too and I probably just use these, all right? These are the ones that I use the most often. I might have to dip into some smaller ones, shock horror, because this is borderline illustration as a project. But for today, I'm going to choose a brush that is going to be a, a nice all-rounder for me so that I can test out some of the materials and not have to worry about it. And what I am going to, my weapon of choice today is going to be this one. So this is the SAA's Imitation Sable Brush. If you've been following my work for the last two or three years, you'll know that I pretty much exclusively use these and no others now, just simply because they, they do the job. I don't uh, need a fistful of other brushes. These ones do it perfectly. So um, there's some whoppers in there. I'm still kind of looking for the project where I can use this one. I have ha I've used it a little bit for doing big backgrounds and things but not nearly as much as I would like to uh, right let's get rid <coughs> of that to one side oh do excuse me I got a frog in my throat this morning I'm just going to have a little sip of water uh -uh -uh. there we go much better now uh, so I've got a brush that I can use and uh, one of the first things I'm going to experiment with is a selection of yellows. We have a B, don't we? So I'm kind of going in here. This is where I am, entry level at the moment. We've got a B to paint. Now, am I going to use watercolour or am I going to use something else? Now, why am I starting here and not at the background? I'm starting here because this is the main event, yeah? I am starting at this point because if I can understand a little bit better how the materials that I want for the main event are going to be used, then it's going to be much easier for me to know what background I want and to know whether I want anything else in the mix as well. If I start with the background, and this is only my process, doesn't isn't necessarily yours, if I start with the background and I go, yes, I'm going to use X, Y, Z for the background, by the time I get to the B, I might have changed my mind and have to go back to the background and start all over again. So if I start with the main event, then I can make some decisions about what it is that I'm going to use and 
then it hopefully will make everything else slot into place. I hope that makes sense. So I'm starting off with watercolour. Why am I starting off with watercolour? I'm starting off with watercolour because I always start off with watercolour. Um, I might be a mixed media painter by definition, but it's all based on watercolour techniques. So I'm going to start with my watercolour paints and see what I think of them. I have uh, two here. So I have cadmium yellow in watercolour. This is De La Rowney's cadmium yellow. It is opaque. Um, and I've got quinacridone gold here as well, which is a Daniel Smith one and is transparent. OK, so I've got those two going on now. Janet um, has uh, asked a very pertinent question. As a relatively newbie, do you think this is a bit ambitious? I've loved watching and will continue to watch. But blimey, I'm somewhat overwhelmed. Is this just me having a bit of a fear factor? Janet, very good point to make. Um, it probably is a bit overwhelming in terms of it depends where you are on your art adventures because uh, like i said if you're following a tutorial then there is um, a process that's gone through by your tutor making all of these decisions for you what i'm trying to do is to help you to understand what those processes are so that when you come to do your own project not that you're necessarily going to choose all of these things it's just so that you can understand the process that you go through to choose all of these things, yeah? So that you need to create your line drawing in a particular way. You need to think about your materials simply because I want all of your projects to succeed. So this is the process that you go through, okay? Now, Janet, nobody is suggesting for a moment, this is a piece of work for me. This is not a tutorial. This is just a piece of work that I'm currently working on so that you can understand the process that I'm going through. So whilst I completely understand that you are feeling a bit overwhelmed, just strap in, sit back, listen to me have to go through them. And then hopefully all of this information will just kind of trickle its way through your own projects. Don't feel that you've got to apply this to everything you do, because like I said, this isn't a tutorial. This is you having a bit of insight into the way my brain works, you poor, poor people. So I'm going to start here with my cadmium yellow, loading up my brush. And all I'm going to do is scribble it onto a piece of paper, have a look, see how it thins out, see how uh, thin or fine I can get it. Look at it in terms of colour. Is that a colour that I like? And the answer is no, not particularly, but then I'm not a massive fan of yellow. <laughs> um, let's go for the quinacridone gold and see if I like that a little better. Um, I probably already know the answer to that because I do prefer quinacridone gold to cadmium yellow. Um, so in the quinacridone gold, if I thin that out, can I get some nicer versions? Now, this is just me. You might be looking at that going, what's she talking about with the cadmium yellow? That's a really lovely colour. <clears throat> That's great. I prefer quinacridone gold. I don't like particularly gaudy yellows. What I desperately need to do is to annotate this because if I don't annotate it, when I come back to look at it next week, um, and some of you probably know I'm taking a few days away at the end of the week <clears throat> to go away. So um, if I come back to this, knowing me, I will be thinking, well, what did I use? This is lovely, but what was it? OK, so. <laughs> um, oh, good, Janet. I'm glad. Yeah, just sit back and, and watch me stress about it. You don't need to at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write underneath what they are. If you really want to annotate it properly, then write down the brand, all of those things. So let's write Quin Gold here. That's a watercolour all of those kind of things. I personally think it's going to be this one. So let's uh, asterisk that for the time being. Now, are there any other considerations? Do I get off the bus at this part of the process and go, well, that's it. I'm just going to use that yellow. Hmm. Is that a good idea? No, of course it's not a good idea, because if we go back to our B, not only have we got to think about the B being painted, but we've got these flowers to consider as well, haven't we? So back to our list. Here we go. Here are the bees, but here are the flowers as well. I've got to make some considerations. Now, am I going to paint my flower yellow to kind of keep within a colour palette for my B? Or... Am I going to inject something else? And if I'm going to inject something else, I don't really want my colours to clash. 
And if I'm going to use a colour palette similar to the B in my flowers, then I don't want it to be the same as my B. So maybe that cadmium yellow is going to come into play. Who knows? Let's have a look and see what else we've got in the realm of stuff to play with. OK, now one thing I have got here is some gouache. If you've not come across gouache before, um, <clears throat> this is like a, a sort of, it's, it used to be called body colour. I give it the horrible, horrible downgrading of posh poster paint, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to say about it. But it is very opaque. It is used a lot in illustration work because it produces a lovely flat colour. Now I've got three yellows here. I've got Winsor Newton's primary yellow. I've got Dale Rowney's cadmium yellow and I've got Dale Rowney's spectrum yellow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little dollop here. That's a very English word, isn't it? Dollop. So oh, you see sliding away. There's the Winsor Newton primary yellow. Here is the Dale Rowney uh, cadmium yellow. <clears throat> and here is the spectrum yellow. Now, before I do anything, I need to write down, oh, brush has fallen on the floor. I need to write down what these are, otherwise I'm gonna forget. So that's primary yellow, Winsor and Newton. Uh, this is, what did I say that was? Cad yellow, which is De La Rowney. And this is a spectrum yellow, which is De La Rowney as well. Your annotation doesn't have to be neat. All it has to be is legible so that when you look back at your colour chart, you know exactly what it is that you're using. Let's thin a few of those out. You should be able to see straight away how much more solid the colour is, even when I uh, thin it out. It's a much flatter colour, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Look at that cadmium yellow. Mm, that is egg yolky, isn't it? Interesting. Working our way down there. And then we've got the spectrum yellow. Ooh, that's nice. I like that. That's kind of fresher, isn't it? This is not wild about that. That is a bit too flat for me. That is a little bit better. So again, let's go for this one. And then what I can do is put a bit of my uh, quinacridone gold next to my spectrum yellow. And I can see what would happen if I use the two in the same picture. So we've got a kind of a nice thin colour that's going to look a little bit more translucent. And then we've got the spectrum yellow. Hmm, maybe. The, oh, well, so this is the thing. You uh, work your way through the materials, testing them out all the time. So I'm thinking that maybe my B is possibly gouache. So I'm going to write that here. And then my flowers are sort of thinner and more translucent because... I will definitely want the B to have some solid quality, so a bit of solidity. And I want my flowers to look kind of soft and ethereal. I don't want it the other way round. I don't want the B to look soft and ethereal and the colours to look really strong. I think I'm going for a much more naturalistic look in my flowers and uh, something much more illustrative in my B. So I'm going to say that my B is going to be gouache and my flowers are going to be watercolour. So there you go, answered some of those questions already. So I'm thinking in terms of colour, we might go for, hmm, let's, let's stake a claim and let's say spectrum yellow for the time being. And the flowers, we haven't really sorted out what colours we want for that yet either. Now, in terms of darks, um, where's my dark? Um, we need uh, the B to have some black or some grey on it. So I'm. this is um, Daniel Smith's James Grey, uh, one of a favourite colour of mine because it has a kind of lilac-y undertone to it. It's kind of a colder grey, which I like an awful lot. I'm so running out of room, <laughs> round and about. I like that quite a lot. That's kind of a nice shadow colour. So I'm thinking maybe the background of the wings for that. 
where's me oh i can't find my pencil now so that's uh james gray and so i'm going to put wings question mark down for that now if i find uh, a dark gray in my uh, gouache which if you're wondering why i'm making straining noises is just because i'm reaching over to try and find all of my grays let's have a look at those what else have we got here so we have got a cool gray we've got a neutral gray and we've got a velvet black so all of those things need to be answered don't they now what's andrea saying absolutely fascinated with this thank you ali need to disappear but we'll catch up later have a great day everybody if you do have to dip in and dip out please don't forget that um you can catch up with this later that's absolutely fine it's a lot of information to take in in one go and of course you know me i'm going at it at breakneck speed <laughs> we're not going to get through to all of it today it's just not going to happen um, just because we like to discuss things in depth and in detail um, what we are going to do is break the back of it and then next week we can carry on with it which I know is spinning out this demonstration a little bit but hopefully it's helpful to you so we're going to put cool grey three on there. We've got neutral grey three on there. And what was the other one? Velvet black. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is, of course, that you aren't necessarily going to have all of these materials. And I get that. This, again, isn't me showing off at the amount of materials that I have. This is me testing them out so that you can see them and then... If they're useful to you you've already seen me demonstrate with them and thought to yourself that's it that's brilliant that's exactly the thing that I want all right so it's me testing them out for you so there's the cool gray three uh, let's uh, it's a bit mm, sort of an all or nothing thing really it's a bit dirty for me not wild about that uh, this is the neutral grey, which is a much nicer colour and actually closer to the James grey. Not identical, but closer to the James grey. And then we've got the velvet black, which is going to be very, very, very black. And I know that there's an argument in terms of do you use black in paintings? And B, hold that thought. Um, and of course, the answer is yes, of course, there's black. The... <laughs> Here's a, a bit of a discussion for you. Slightly controversial, all right? We like the controversy. Slightly controversial. Lots of people will say to you, there is no black in nature, okay? And therefore, you shouldn't use black in your painting. That isn't true, <laughs> okay? Most black pigments come from things like charcoal or burning or oil or any of those kind of things. Those are natural products you of course find black in nature what you don't find is uniform black in nature okay so you need variation and this is what we're talking about here um i personally like the velvet black because i think in an illustrative project we get our bee back in again where i need my bee to be really black and to have some solidity to it i'm going to need something that packs a punch so stuck my hand back in it so i'm going to go for the velvet black and i'm going to go for the james gray now lynn has just asked a question that i've just seen come in you went straight to james gray when i know you also love the saa's translucent gray too might i ask why you choose one over the other because i did have a little bit of an annoying um foresight that neutral gray and james gray were very similar to each other but I might change my mind by next week, Lynn. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, now, Jane H is saying something. Uh, now I know why my paintings are rubbish. I just dive in. Fail to plan, plan to fail. Never a truer word in my case. Thank you for all this insight into what I should be doing. Okay, Jane, I know you. I have painted with you. Your paintings are not rubbish at all. Um, I do think it's worth the discussion about a little bit of planning. 
okay? Um, you can over plan, of course. You can, you know, only get to this part of the process and actually not do the execution, which is something uh, that's like me and YouTube videos. I watch 100 YouTube videos, don't put it into practice. So um, planning to a degree, I think. Trudy is asking me a question. Do you prefer De La Rani gouache over Windsor and Newton gouache? Uh, a very, very good question, Trudy. Thank you very much for asking that. Um, I, I just have a bit of, um, what's the word? Um, De La Rani gouache is what I taught myself to paint on. And so I return to De La Rani gouache simply because I know how it works. Um, I, I can expect what comes out of the tube. I can predict how it's going to work. But by the same token, um, I'm teaching a workshop in a couple of weeks where I have suggested that's, that you buy a particular pink of uh, Windsor & Newton gouache because it's better than the De La Rowney one. So uh, this is my sort of default setting. That's, that's the word I was looking for because I know it. Um, I think they are of equal standing myself. Oh, yes. Kate is saying I like cherry pit black, slightly off black. Yes, that is the new um, liquid charcoal, isn't it? The um, charcoal in a tube. And yes, I agree with you. Very, very lovely as well. Uh, so we've got those things going on. Um, uh, haven't kind of got to the grips. I need to stare at this effectively. What I do need to do now, I've got a bit of an idea about my colour palette. I can now go back to my background and make some decisions about that. And of course, I haven't quite got to that yet. Um, I am loving this colour at the moment, which is a colour um, made by Daniel Smith, which is called Shadow Violet. Okay, again, I haven't made a decision about my colours for my background yet, but I do quite like this as a soft kind of grey. Now, I'm putting it down here now because I've got this whole set of blacks going on. And actually, um, I can now see, can you see how these uh, greys here, they have quite a blue bias. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that they are on the colder side of black. And this shadow violet, despite being, being called a violet, can you see that's actually got a sort of pinky brown tinge to it? So it doesn't really fit in with my colour palette. Um, and this is why scribbling it on a piece of paper with your other colours is really important. You can't just pick them at random and hope that this sort of disparate collection of colours will all go together. It's actually very important that you lay them down next to each other to see if they all fit. Now, of course, of course, I think Anne B, yes, it was Anne B, said earlier, what no moon glow. Ah, oh, dear. <clears throat> yes, the moon glow is making an appearance. Now, why is moon glow making an appearance? You can all, hy all hypothesise about why moon glow is making an appearance. It's making an appearance primarily because it is my favourite watercolour paint. But it's also making an appearance because... On a colour wheel, for those of you who um, haven't done uh, much colour theory yet, let's draw a very bad colour wheel over here. So on a colour wheel, the point of a colour wheel is to understand colour theory. And maybe that's another Technique Tuesday for another time. Maybe that's a resource that goes on the new website. OK, you need to understand the relationship between colours, not only because um, you need to be able to mix them in future, but so that you can understand the relationship between them all. So if we put yellow there and red there and blue there, space them out on our colour wheel, those are our primary colours. And then in between we have our secondary colours. So that's mixes of what is either side of the space. So yellow and red uh, make orange, blue and yellow make green, and blue and red make what? Purple? No, they don't. They make violet. It's called violet in colour terms, okay? Now, in very basic form, this is very important to understand, not only because what colours go next to each other, but also what colours are opposite each other. So those are called complementary pairings. Why are they important? They're important because what they create is when you put things that are opposite each other, 
on the color wheel next to each other, they cause something called an optical vibration. Now, for those of you who are going, yeah, I was bamboozled enough with this. Just sit back for the ride from this. Take it as red. We'll talk about this another day, all right? An optical vibration occurs when two colors complement each other. That's why they're called complementary pairings. And they occur opposite each other on the color wheel. So yellow, which is obviously going to feature very heavily. Look at what's opposite it on the color wheel. Violet. Okay, so we could choose some violets for our color selection. And then that way we're going to make our yellows look even more yellow. And so, of course, Moon Glow, which falls into that category of violets, I grant you that Moon Glow is a colour that um, is towards the more subtle end of violets. But look, isn't that delicious? I mean, what's not to like about that? Not that I'm biased or anything. So that might be a consideration for our background. Maybe we want to enhance that a little bit, but I am definitely gonna go for watercolor in my background and I'm gonna consider moon glow, all right? I am also going to consider this which is a colour called Rose of Ultramarine. Now it is a colour that has um, a, a much more of a red bias, so it's a little bit more pink, but I've got those flowers to consider as well, haven't I? So maybe if we just pitch a little bit of Moon Glow together with our Rose of Ultramarine, I've got some nice interesting colour combinations going on over here too. So that might be a consideration. Let's annotate that. Um, I forgot to annotate this. So let's get that. Now who was it who said, um, Rosie was saying she can't see violet in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of with you, Rosie. Um, and this one is Rose of Ultramarine. Um, those are both Daniel Smith colours, by the way. So I've got that as a consideration because maybe that Rose of Ultramarine is going to be uh, a decent colour to think of for my flowers too, all right? Um, lots of people saying how much they like Rose of Ultramarine. So can you see, whilst I'm thinking about what materials I'm going to use, I am also testing colours out as I go. I sort of started in one place and I'm going backwards and forwards, making those decisions and making them all for the right reasons. Now, another thing that I am just going to throw into the mix before we part company uh, for today are these. Now, this is the Derwent Ink Tense Pan Set. Why am I chucking this into the mix? I'm chucking this into the mix because ink tents in pencil form or stick form or pan form goes very well as a material together with these types of colours. It's kind of based on the principles of ink more than anything else, hence the word ink tents. Um, they are waterproof when they are dry, they don't shift, so they become very useful for layering up and all of those kind of things. And they've got some interesting colours in there too. Now one of them, as you can see, I've used it quite a lot, is their fuchsia colour. So uh, let's take a little bit of that fuchsia and introduce that into the mix because it's a slightly brighter version of Rose of Ultramarine. So maybe I can uh, put that together in with there too. So let's just write ink tents and uh, fuchsia. And then in one of the, it's not in that set, is it in this set? No, it's not that set. <laughs> Too much stuff around over here. They've uh, got a rather nice yellow too, and I can't remember what it's called. I've lost the little insert. But again, that might be a very useful yellow for our selection of yellows that we're potentially looking at. So I'm going to put that down on my piece of paper too. So I've got those things going on. Lots of stuff going on. So the last thing I'm going to think about. So I haven't really answered the honeycomb dilemma. Um, I haven't really answered uh, all of the questions about my flower colours yet. And I haven't answered the question about anything else. Those are things we can come back to next week. The last thing I want to look at 
is the possibility of using some brusho. Now, why would I use brusho? Why would I do that to myself when most of you know that the inclusion of brusho is going to be, how shall I put it, um, a kind of an unknown quantity where you sprinkle it on the paper, it's going to produce an effect that creates a bit of disorder. Why would I do that to myself? when I can create such beautiful order with the colours I've already chosen. Let's have a think about why that might be. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. I am doing that because my biggest fear with this project is that it is all too formal. It's all terribly controlled. This is here, this is there, that's the other. Everything's got an outline and I need it to have some spontaneity. And Lynn, yes, you're absolutely right. It needs some movement in there. It needs some chaos to make the order look deliberate, okay? So I am thinking background, honeycomb, bit of brusho, and then B on the top. And <laughs> yes, Anne B has called it brusho, the surprise element. Couldn't be more right, Anne. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test out whether this is the right colour for me. This is gamboge. This is a really good colour in brusho, in my opinion. Now, because I've got my board on a slant and because I've got all sorts of other wet things going on, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to spritz a little area of my paper down here, sprinkle some of the gamboge brusho into it, and then I'll have that. Oh, yes. Sorry, I just got momentarily distracted. Janet has said brusho pollen, maybe. Ah, you see, I didn't read that, Janet. And that is a fantastic idea. When somebody says, why that? I can say, well, it's the pollen. And Jane H has um, put a very, very bad joke on. <laughs> Love you, Jane. Uh, so um, I'm going to just mop this little puddle of stuff up down here. And then I'm going to, not terribly carefully, take the lid off of my gamboge. Probably just taking the lid off will produce, yes, I haven't even needed to use the palette knife to sprinkle it on. I took the lid off and there you go. Lots of brusho on the paper. Is that the right colour is my next question. It looks quite orange when it's on there, but... I might not only be using um, moon glow in my background, I might drop a bit of cerulean in there too. In which case, if we're going for cerulean, which comes under our blue heading, look at what's opposite it. So I'm occupying at the moment this part of the colour wheel. So I've got the blue and the violet and I've got the yellow and the orange going on. All right. So I am occupying those kind of areas of colour to see whether they are going to work. Now the cerulean behind the honeycomb. So maybe the honeycomb is moon glow and maybe the background is cerulean. Okay, these are all things to think about, aren't they? And I really, you know, I like that pattern. I like... The, um, it would probably be finer than that on my final painting, but that certainly, certainly gives me a really good place to start. So in summary, what have we gone for? We think that the background is going to be possibly cerulean, maybe a bit of moon glow in there too. The honeycomb, I'm now thinking maybe that's the moon glow Maybe it has a bit of Rose of Ultramarine. So I'm looking at these kind of colours in the background. So they're actually a little bit cooler as well to, to push back. Maybe I have that bit of brusho. So I'm much closer to the answer to those first three things. Then the B. We're kind of floating around this idea, aren't we, of using both gouache and possibly a bit of watercolour going in there. Same with our darks, maybe the velvet black, maybe a bit of Jane's grey, all of that kind of thing. Uh, Joy is asking, which makeup cerulean are you using? I'm actually using Daniel Smith, um, Joy, but the Dale Rowney one is just as good. Um, so we've got that kind of uh, discussion going on where the B is possibly going to be a slightly stronger colour. We haven't really answered the flower thing yet in terms of 
what the colours are going to be but we have sort of bumped around the edges of the fact that it's probably going to be watercolour maybe we've got some rows of ultramarine in there maybe we've got a little bit of watercolour going on all of those kind of things uh, occurring what we haven't answered is anything else now I can't actually answer anything else at the moment because that is look how far down the list of things in the order that we said we were going to paint them look how far down that comes all right need to put the background in need to think about the honeycomb need to put the brush o in then i need to think about the bee then i need to think about the pl the flower how can i possibly answer anything else when i don't know how this is all going to turn out so for the time being all i'm going to do is make a list of potentials all right so it could be metallic yeah i could put a little bit of bling on the end maybe i need some posca pens for some color maybe i need some fine liners okay maybe i need some gouache because maybe i've made a boo-boo somewhere but i can't answer any of that until all of this is in place okay so it is 11 o'clock and I'm sure you all need to lie down in a dark room but what I'm hoping is that all of that information has given you some sort of insight into how I go about choosing the materials that I do and the colour systems that I do too. Now I haven't got to the end of that yet next week I need to go away and think about this I need to kind of prop it up in the studio take a few days away and come back to it and go oh yes actually it's that maybe I'll go away from this project and go oh no why didn't I include that I really want to use that so these are not finite decisions they're certainly not the right way of doing it they're not the wrong way of doing it either they're just my thought process and how I go through this what materials do I use and what colour system do I use too? Now, I know that that's a lot of information and I know some of you um, have been saying that it's quite overwhelming. Yes, it is a, a little bit overwhelming. Sit back, enjoy the ride. This is something that will pop up into the back of your head the next time you do a project. It will be, oh, actually, I need to think about a colour wheel. I need to think about what colours I'm using. What was it that Ali said about using colour wheels? So just cherry pick the information as it suits you. Go back, watch it again. Something will stick, I promise you. Something will stick. You can't learn all of these things all in one go. You know, it'd be like buying a piano and expecting to play Rachmaninoff. Not possible. You've got to learn to read the music. You've got to learn to play the scales. You've got to learn where the keys are on the keyboard before you can get to that part of it. You've just got to learn it incrementally. I really hope that helps in terms of insights in your projects and uh, working towards being a most more self-sufficient artist. Now, the big news. I said I'd top and tail, didn't I? So the big news uh, that's just gone out this weekend is that from the 29th of August, there will be a brand spanking new website for you to peruse. It will get updated much more frequently than my old one, and it will be the place for all kinds of tuition. What is it? It is www.learningtopaint.co.uk. Much easier to remember. There's going to be inspiration on there. There's going to be tutorials. There's going to be video on demand. There's going to be a place for you to get all your resources in terms of materials. That's going to be the home of the Technique Tuesday blog because I'm going to have a second blog going on as well, but we'll talk more about that later. And uh, my email address is going to alter as well, which is also going to be much easier to remember. So that's going to be Ali, A-L-I, at learningtopaint.co.uk. So you hopefully won't ever forget it. Now, don't forget that if you like to watch these Technique Tuesday broadcasts live, then you need to be a member of my Learning to Paint community over on Facebook. Of course, I will always archive it on the website but if you like to take part and you like to chat to each other and your Tuesday mornings are made just a little tiny bit brighter by Technique Tuesday coming to you live then don't forget that learning to paint community is there for supporting encouraging and for you to share your work too and I've got exciting news coming at the end of the week about that too
Now I'm away for a few days. Um, I've got a class to teach tonight. I know some of you are on that sunflower class tonight. And then I'm away for a few days at Bees. That's my husband. And uh, I are hoping to snatch a few days away um, just because he's on his summer holidays. So we're, we're hoping to, to go and do some exciting things. So my apologies if I don't get back to you as quickly as you might like over the coming week or so. Um, but I'm really looking forward to a bit of time away. And I will see you same time, same place temporarily for Technique Tuesday next week. We'll talk a little bit more about the colour and the materials, but we'll get started on that project and we'll see how it's all going to transpire. So until I see you then, take lots of care of yourselves, take lots of care of each other too. Have a great, great week and we will speak very soon. All right, bye. <laughs>